In retrospect, some would say, October 23rd, 1985 was the day the Chinese Communist Party died. By the mid-80s, virtually every inch of the country had been transformed by well over a decade of radical economic reform. But after that day in October, when Deng Xiaoping explicitly described state policy as quote, letting some people get rich first, the proverbial cat was undeniably and seemingly irreversibly out of the bag. It didn't matter what ism defined its economy, or in the words of Deng, what color the cat was only that it was effective at catching mice, for ideology had no place in this new China. Class struggle and collectivization had already given way to new inequalities. But with Deng's unequivocal proclamations, gone too was even the facade. There was nothing especially subtle about it. Any American visitor to China in the roughly 30 years after 1980, myself included, inevitably returns with the same surprised observation. China looks more capitalist than America. And that's saying something. Most iconically, there are the McDonald's. So, so many McDonald's. And you can't miss the KFCs. Twice as many, in fact, as in America. Street vendors everywhere trying to make a buck. Shopping malls, Apple stores, and designer handbags. Chinese consumerism is globally unmatched in its ostentatiousness. But the culture of capitalism has seeped much deeper than mere brand names. The American obsession with buying houses launched the greatest financial crisis of the 21st century, yet is thoroughly put to shame by the Chinese, who collect third and even fourth homes, all empty, bought before completion, and likely to never be lived in by anyone like the rest of the world collects stamps. Then there are the class distinctions. Americans are no strangers to economic inequality, but at least in theory, no law stops you from packing up and moving to Beverly Hills. In China, your place of birth quite literally determines your place in the world. Household registration, or hukou, means you can move from middle of nowhere Gansu province to cosmopolitan Shanghai, but its public schools, hospitals, and jobs will forever be legally off-limits. Place of birth matters everywhere, but only in China do authorities not even pretend otherwise. And if that doesn't convince you socialism with Chinese characteristics is but a euphemism for state capitalism, there's plenty more evidence to choose from. Starting in 1980, international corporations could buy advertising space in the Communist Party's official magazine, albeit with one exception. Coca-Cola was explicitly banned. In the two years between 1986 and 88, student support for communism fell from 38% to just 6.1. And bear in mind, these are officially sanctioned surveys. Deng Xiaoping even warned that although China should maintain vigilance against the right, it should be primarily wary of the left. Since the death of Mao, the Communist Party has maintained only the thinnest veneer of tradition in the interest of continuity, acting out the motions of increasingly vague five-year plans and increasingly predictable Politburo procedure. But while the rest of the world has largely played along with this political theater, we've all long since realized. Underneath this nearly transparent Maoist packaging is pure, raw, Big Mac-loving, unadulterated capitalism in all but name. Then, Xi Jinping happened. Today, after a decade of this new era, you wouldn't just have to be an optimist to not see how things have changed. You'd truly have to be living under a rock. And to notice the similarities between Mao and Xi is to be confronted with an uncomfortable question. Did this Maoist revival emerge spontaneously, implausibly manufactured by one man alone? Or did even the most clear-eyed China watchers fundamentally misunderstand the past five decades? One way or another, a reappraisal is overdue. Sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. 
Get both for just 15 bucks a year and watch my latest Nebula exclusive original debunking the myth that China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Despite being one of the most common myths about China, I've been unable to cover it for fear of demonetization. Until now, thanks to Nebula. Sign up and get access to all five of these exclusive original episodes and much more. On the 9th of September, 1976, China experienced the most traumatic and destabilizing thing that can happen to a cult of personality. The death of that personality. With the sole exception, perhaps, of North Korea's Kim Il-sung, no country has ever had so many of its political eggs in one basket. China was the Communist Party. And the Communist Party was Mao. His complete monopoly on power created a volatile vacuum of power and all but guaranteed a secession crisis after his fatal heart attack. How you interpret what happens next is where history diverges. In one version, the one most of us have come to believe, the death of Mao forced the party, indeed the entire country, to do some serious soul-searching. His absence gave Deng's generation room to critically re-examine the horrors of the past quarter century and steer the country in a new direction. There's simply no denying that the scale and speed of China's modernization was a direct result of these reforms. Had Mao's four confidants not been purged a mere month after his death, the word TikTok would probably still mean an early 2000s pop song. You wouldn't know what Shenzhen is today. In a very different version of history, Deng Xiaoping's greatest innovation is not liberalizing the Chinese economy, exactly, but knowing the secret passwords to join the globalized American-led export market. In this world, China's post-Mao leaders realize there's a practical limit to the amount of starvation the average person is willing to endure in the name of peasant revolution. They realize, after 89, that photographs of tanks do a lot of damage to the national brand, and firing squads are bad for business. At home, China maintains the prominence of Mao and continues speaking the language of socialism. But abroad, it emphasizes the with Chinese characteristics part. It's a ruse the rest of the world is either too naive to notice or too blinded by dollar signs to act on. The truth, it would seem, is an uneasy mix of both though probably more of the latter. On one hand, Mao's death did allow for the entry of a new, previously mythical, M-word to the government's vocabulary. Mistake. Accompanying it were democracy, opposition, and even, if you can believe it, human rights. Though its precise definition may have been, shall we say, lost in translation. Yet, no sooner had Deng uttered these words when old red lines were redrawn. In other words, the scope of permissible speech widened by a remarkable degree in a remarkably short period of time. But Deng's four cardinal principles still left a lot to be desired. In the party's own words, Mao's contributions to the Chinese Revolution far outweigh his mistakes. Another important thing to note, something that may have been dismissed as a mere historical detail for the 50 years between then and now, but today, in 2022, is clearly anything but, is the fact that Mao's death led to the very first policy debates in the PRC. For the first time in the country's history, you could say things like, hmm, maybe Mao was only 70% correct. That's a pretty big deal, much bigger than it sounds. That 30% tolerance could be the difference between, say, China being comfortable importing foreign-made mRNA vaccines and sealing its borders shut for years to come. Anyway, history remembers the victor, and Deng's reformist camp was decisively victorious. But that makes it all too easy to forget that there were other factions. The more Maoist, leftist coalition slowly faded from the spotlight, but in hindsight, never quite disappeared. Leftists couldn't exactly speak their minds freely, yet still enjoyed some protection under the banner of the unassailable great chairman. Censorship is always a cat and mouse game, and the more aggressive the cat, 
the more clever become the mice. Political groups in China quickly learned that they could get away with just a little bit more while waving a little red book. Ultimately, leftists were at the mercy of the reformist-led Communist Party, who reluctantly tolerated their existence, if only as a counterbalance to the right. But what Deng couldn't have predicted was that several earth-shattering global crises many years later would unexpectedly tip the balance once again in the leftists' favor allowing them to re-emerge from the shadows. However profoundly the fall of the Soviet Union may have affected the world, it hit especially close to home in China. The two countries had long since splintered ideologically, but they still had more in common than not. With the Russians out of the picture and no other large industrialized role models to be found, China was effectively left to carry the mantle of socialism alone. This was uncharted territory, and the stakes, clearly, were existential. But what, exactly, was the lesson for Chinese leaders? While Deng's reformers learned that the Soviets had liberalized too slowly, leftists took away the opposite conclusion, that reform was the problem. Whatever disagreements lingered, they were thoroughly put to rest after 2008. Just as the Soviet collapse triggered anxious introspection and delivered a political win for the leftist coalition, so too did the global financial crisis reverberate in China. While Americans were preoccupied with real estate and the rest of the world with its second, third, and fourth order effects, China buckled down for a storm pumping an unfathomable amount of credit into its economy in anticipation of hard times to come. Shiny airports, roads, roads to the middle of nowhere, roads connecting two middle of nowheres, and yes, the colossal high-speed rail network the rest of the world marvels at. But the looming storm never arrived. Even though many of these roads proved useless and high-speed trains to the desert sat predictably empty, when the expected alternative was mass unemployment, it felt a lot like a victory. Not only did China emerge from the global financial crisis unscathed, but it did so as the only major economy to actually grow. And by double digits, no less. In just a few short months, Chinese leaders both lost their reverence for U.S. economic policy, arguably U.S. policy, period, and gained immense self-confidence in their own system. Or rather, regained. The last time China stood this tall was under Mao. The 2008 Beijing Olympics didn't hurt either. Meanwhile, around that same time, the son of a powerful revolutionary named Bo Shi Lai rises to national fame precisely by tapping into this Maoist nostalgia. Bo was not a normal Chinese bureaucrat. He was charismatic, he liked the spotlight, and most importantly, he was not boring. This highly unusual personal approach to politics both made him extremely well-liked and probably led to his ultimate demise. In short, Bo Xi Lai was described as Mini Mao and his policies as ushering in Chinese Socialism 3.0. He built affordable housing, saved struggling state enterprises, and helped level the playing field for poor migrants. Above all, he proved that socialism, at least one particular flavor, still had cachet in China. Not unlike Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, his popularity exposed a long dormant political segment. Now, nothing changed overnight. New McDonald's were still being built. The iPhone was only beginning to achieve velocity, largely built with Chinese manufacturing and bought by the Chinese middle class. But if you were looking closely, the stage had been set the Chinese leftist movement was making a comeback. When Xi Jinping inherited power in 2012, he was reportedly shocked to discover CIA spies working at the highest levels of the party. That, of course, was concerning on its own. But even more concerning was what that meant. 
After three decades of market reform, China had become near-fatally capitalist. We're not talking about DC lobbyist crony capitalism here. There was a second-hand market for cadre positions. Let that sink in. You could buy your way into the Communist Party, albeit under the table. That was how the CIA allegedly infiltrated the party. They simply paid. And if cadres were willing to sell out their country that easily, it goes without saying. The only chairman these corrupt officials were loyal to was the Mao staring back at them on banknotes. She was horrified to find China occupied by capitalists. As we saw in this earlier video, public-private collusion enabled breakneck economic growth. It turns out the right kind of corruption can actually speed up development. But we see now that it also threatens such necessities to the survival of the Communist Party as its chain of command. Xi realized this and launched a multi-year anti-corruption campaign that took down not hundreds or thousands but millions of bureaucrats across China. In fact, it never really ended. Many on the outside interpreted this campaign through the lens of a dictator accumulating power. Corruption, after all, is a common pretext for eliminating one's rivals. But this misses the forest for the trees. Of course, Xi Jinping took out some competitors along the way, but it's doubtful he identified a million and a half competitors. And of course he's trying to consolidate power. But to what end? A closer look at history reveals that many of Xi's signature campaigns began under his predecessor, Hu Jintao. Although the ship was turning too slowly for many to notice, the new course had long been set. As any socialist will tell you, capitalism becomes entrenched. The vanguard of the proletariat, cadres, tend to lose sight of their comrades once they own a BMW. The difference between Hu and Xi is not so much ideology, but that only the latter has the political power to overcome this obstacle. Xi Jinping didn't instigate the socialist revival, but he was the first to make it practically possible and he doesn't have much time. The usual explanation for the Communist Party's continued existence amidst a sea of capitalism is performance legitimacy, or the implicit agreement. We will make you rich, it goes, and you won't challenge our authority. But perhaps this theory says more about us than it does about China. If you're really looking, there's a mountain of evidence suggesting sincere ideology was there all along. It's obvious, in retrospect, that reform had a lifespan. Economic growth can't go on indefinitely. Even in a country of 1.4 billion, you can only build so many high-speed trains. This places the party on tenuous ground because its legitimacy would be at the whim of volatile stock markets and real estate bubbles. But even if growth did continue, the Communist Party's unique claim to power would weaken with each passing year. While China was getting rich, lots of other countries were getting rich too. Reform-era China didn't have a compelling source of national pride. Listen closely, and China's own leaders have made clear that making people rich was never its complete strategy. This emphasis on economic growth was always a temporary and partial measure. Even reformers believed in some version of socialism. They just disagreed on how best to get there. Although it's ruled by a communist party, it does not claim to be a communist state. Communism, after all, is a utopian destination that even its most ardent supporters don't believe is on the horizon anytime soon. This is the fundamental source of confusion. Outsiders, even or especially experts not familiar with Chinese history, see a country replete with markets and privately owned companies. They see, as we did, that even Communist Party ranks can be bought for cash and conclude that socialism is obviously a facade, 
a misunderstanding which ironically has suited China quite well. But look even closer and it's clear that this is itself a facade. Deng Xiaoping said this explicitly. The state could never truly distance itself from Mao because he was inseparable from the party. The writing has been on the wall if only we were looking since 1980, just three years after Mao's death. The party was only ever going to deviate from its origins so much. And remember, that was the best case, coming from Mr. Reform and Opening himself. Now, there's some truth to the implicit agreement. You can easily see how the proletariat would be more or less patient on the path to utopia depending on how many Big Macs they can afford. But while reform could have been longer, shorter, stricter, or looser depending on which coalition won, the existence of the Communist Party requires that it eventually justify its monopoly on power. Otherwise, anyone could rule China. The other common justification for the party is the argument that, despite its flaws, it did lift 800 million people out of poverty. It's the retort that any critique of China is met with. But there's just one problem. It's not really true. I've wanted to debunk this myth for years, but the only way to do so honestly is with a rather grim and gruesome inspection of Chinese history, which demonetization makes impossible on YouTube. Thanks to Nebula, I was finally able to make this video, which is now my fifth full-length Nebula exclusive original video. The amazing thing is that by signing up for the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle, you can watch all five of these exclusive videos plus all these normal videos sponsor free and other great Nebula originals for just 15 bucks a year. In other words, you can start getting about 50% more polymatter for just 15 bucks a year by signing up to the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle. On Curiosity Stream, you'll find great feature length documentaries like this closer look at one of history's most notoriously evil men. Click the link on screen right now to get both Nebula and CuriosityStream for 15 bucks a year and go watch my original series over on Nebula.